Hey everybody, this is Ben Kesnoka, co-founder and partner at Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is our podcast, where we go deep on all things business and technology with world-leading experts. Hello, everybody. I'm Olga Sugievich, and our guest today is Christopher Ailman. Chris has been the Chief Investment Officer of Calsters since October 2000. Today, Calsters is the largest educator-only pension fund in the world and the second largest pension fund in the U.S., Chris joined Calsters in 2000, and over the last 20 years, he has grown the portfolio from $100 billion to over $317 billion while producing top quartile results. He has helped the organization navigate a number of economic cycles, has achieved a number of different awards, and we are super happy to have him on. In today's conversation, we'll talk about uh, Chris's reflections on his investing career, on what opportunities he sees in the markets today, and, and a lot more. Thank you, Olga. I'm pleased to be here. Honored to be here. Um, we usually start with investment content, and then I like to finish with something which gives listeners a glimpse of the speaker as a person, but I'd like to change that up in this interview. So let's start with Chris overall. As a CIO, person, father, husband, what drives you and what defines your life goals? Well, actually, you just about nailed it. Uh, I've uh, Very on early in my career, I worked for a Wall Street firm that sent us to a seminar where the person said, hey, you have to know what you stand for just in simple letters, and that's your guiding post through life. So I thought about it, and I realized that uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, I'm a father, now I'm a grandfather, and then I'm a chief investment officer. And I kind of try to make my decisions of life in that order and keep those in perspective. Obviously, your job and career consumes a ton of your time and energy, but you don't want to forget the other things are really important to you and, and make those. So I would say, in a nutshell, that's who I am. I'd like to add cyclist and athlete at the bottom, but boy, you know, I, I have to admit that I'm pretty much failing at that, but I'll get back to it. Well, it sounds like a well-diversified portfolio of interests. So let's talk about Calsters. Tell us a bit about the history of the organization, whom you view as your peers in the industry, and how your program might be similar and different. Well, Calsters is really an interesting uh, pension plan. Not a lot of people know about us. We're the California Teachers Retirement System. We cover all the public school teachers in the state of California, kindergarten through community college. So a million members. And it's super old. It was created in 1913. So it's older than Social Security. Uh, and it started, you know, it's not surprised, just pay as you go through the, the 20s and 30s and all the way up to the late 50s. Then they finally started to fund it and make it a defined benefit plan. Um, it was always underfunded. Sadly, that's a true around the country is that people tended to not contribute properly to the teacher retirement funds. Um, and then when we finally got up to the 2000s, uh, right before the 2000s with the bull market in the 80s and the 90s, we finally reached fully funding. But uh, we had to give away more benefits because not surprising, teachers that re had retired in the 70s retired at incomes that were at the poverty level. So they increased the benefits for those, which I think was very wise. Um, and, uh, you know, our funding level declined. When I got here in 2000, you have to remember that was before 9-11, back when airports, you could walk all the way to the gate at an airport. Um, so, you know, I realize now that was, I haven't figured out, I don't think cell phones, cell phones were around, but I don't think iPhones were even created back then. So, uh, you know, it was very early. It has grown from a, a bill, 100 billion to 300 billion, but that's what it should have done with normal compounding. Arithmetically, it's averaged over eight percent, but geometrically, not to get technical, we don't we live life on a geometric average, not a arithmetic one year at a time. You know, we went through the the uh, uh, ninety nine to o two bear market and obviously nine eleven tragedy. Uh, we had to go through the uh, 2008 global financial crisis. So those kind of potholes really held back the uh, geometric return over time. But we're we're on a funding plan. We're doing well. Um, and, you know, it's a fun fact about California teachers. 72% uh, of the population is female. They're all college educated. So it's really a fun group to, to manage money and manage their pension. The challenge is longevity. In California, we have over 400 members that are over 100 years old and still getting their pension. 
And people are always amazed, but you know, they live in California, they're non-smokers, generally have healthier diets, and they're active as teachers. So uh, it's a really neat group to, to manage money for. When you ask about our peers, we we in the USA, there's only one fund bigger than us, and that's CalPERS here in the same in the state as well, just across the river from us. Uh, New York Common is fairly large, um, uh, Ohio, some of the other states, Texas teachers. But we really look around the globe as our peers. Uh, some of them are sovereign wealth funds like Government of Singapore, uh, but then other pension plans uh, up in Canada. We call them the Maple Eight, but uh, Ontario teachers, uh, CPPIB, uh, which is a Canadian public pension plan. And then the Netherlands, a couple of very good well-run plans, APB and PGGM. Um, we interact with all those. Uh, we interact with some of the major Australian funds, uh, New Zealand uh, uh, superannuation fund. Uh, really, the globe are our peers because we have similar, different liabilities, but similar objectives, uh, which is making a return over a generation. So very long-term investors. Uh, and that's what we have a lot, uh, a lot of commonality in our focus and our perspectives of how to manage risk and seek return. And you've managed the program through a number of downturns in 2001, 2008. Um, you know, given the, the fact that you do have a long-term orientation in mind, I'm sure that when a lot is happening in the markets and it's all going sort of not in the direction that you want to, as a CIO, um, what, what are some of your reflections on how to steer the ship through some of those unique events, unique negative events in the markets? Well, I'm not going to kid anyone when I say that those are the hardest times to manage a big portfolio. I often tell uh, people that are asking me about this job, the hardest part is losing other people's money. You know, it's hard and you get mad when you lose your own money. But when you lose somebody else's money as a fiduciary, it just pains you. Um, and I, I will be very open and honest and tell you that 08 was the darkest time in my life. I, I said to my staff, my life is completely falling apart. Um, you know, when we declined $5 billion a day, um, I got the staff together and I said, hey, you know, we need to, you know, these are the darkest times, but we need to band together. And I literally said to him, you know, while we don't talk to the teachers much, I said, you know, teachers, you bump into them in the grocery store, tell them we're doing okay, we're surviving. Because uh, in the end, I knew they were going to be okay. It is a defined benefit plan. Um, but, you know, I also tried to, to sort of plan a flag for everybody that, you know, this is a moment time that you're going to read in textbooks. Uh, you know, the MBA students in two years are going to be studying this time period. It's so hard when you're living it to have that perspective, but you have to back away a little bit. And, you know, the toughest thing when everything, remember in 08, correlations quickly approached one. So everything, diversification failed you. As I always said to people, it's kind of like, you know, you, you put your eggs in more than one basket, but in 08, it was like all the baskets were glued together and they all fell at once. So uh, it just really was about preserving capital, getting together as a team. We really huddled a lot during that time period and, and all the asset classes shared what was going on and where they saw risk, where they saw opportunities. And we learned that risk isn't just the first issue. It's the second derivative, third derivative. It's kind of like, you know, if a bank fails, it's not just the bank, but who loaned money to that bank, who loaned money to them, and who loaned money to them. So you really have to look out three or four layers to understand all of your risk in those times of environments. But we know from history that those kinds of downturns are also an absolute unique opportunity so I can tell you in early 09, we were huddling around and trying to create, we created what we call an ER committee, kind of like the emergency room. It actually stood for equity return is, hey, capital is scarce. Any capital we put to work, we ought to be getting at least a 20% rate of return. And everybody that had an idea came together. And I think some of our, I can say, some of our best returning investments were out of that we didn't catch the bottom. We didn't turn and start investing in equities. You know, I remember the day, March, March 9th of 09. But uh, we did start investing by that May. So uh, that really helped us rebound the plan. And we've learned that, you know, in downturns, if you can save a little bit of money in a downturn and then be ready for that upturn, 
over a long time period, if you can drop, uh, fill in those potholes a little bit, um, that you really have a higher rate of return. It's not about calling the tops. It's about trying to miss those bottoms. And diversification helps, but that's also a lesson where in 08, it was different diversification that helped you in 08 than helped you in 0102. And if you go back to, to 91, 94, 87, go all the way back to 73, 74, you really study the bear markets. You realize no one bear market is alike. Uh, they're all different. They all have different movements. Uh, you know, the old adage, uh, Wall Street falls down the elevator shaft, but it climbs the stairs is very true. And uh, so you just have to have a, a policy, a plan. And, and that's the key is having discipline during that time period. The old adage, invest without emotion is very true, but so hard to do. When all the news around you is negative and everything is so bad, it is so hard to stick to your policy and say, no, we should rebalance and actually start buying. Uh, because I can tell you in March of 09, the headlines were horrible, but that actually was the bottom. Yep. <clears throat> yes. Being being contrarian, being able to invest when everybody is fearing and vice versa, it tends to be extremely difficult. And a lot of our audience are GPs and people who start different types of funds. So as you look back at some of those challenging times in the markets, um, thinking what what would be your advice to investment managers? You know, what what were some of the ways that they were communicating with you or how they were approaching the situation um, that sort of stood out? What are some of the best practices? And then what are some of the things that, that maybe sometimes investment managers do that you would advise against? Thanks, Olga. If I could go back to a big room of GPs, I would say to them, look at the 98, 99 vintage year. Uh, look at the uh, 05, 06 vintage years. Take note of the size of the fund people raised and how quickly they re-raised funds. So just because you can raise a fund and raise a giant fund, maybe it doesn't mean you should. Um, and we're guilty too. Almost all the LPs put in money because the opportunity door opened during that time period. Those are the worst vintage years because lo and behold, shortly thereafter, with all that flood of money, we had a, a recession and markets fell apart and people invested right before the recession at very high EBITDA multiples. And sure enough, when you buy high, then the floor fell out and it was, if they took years to finally recover some of those companies, or in some cases, they just threw the keys back at the banks and let those companies go. So when you look at the vintage years and you look at the flow of the private equity market, it tends to be uh, the not that always the biggest funds are the worst, but you really need to be cautious about chasing those opportunities and thinking everything is going to be perfect. When stuff is priced perfection, that means it has to turn out to perfection for you to make a decent return. You're not going to make an above average return. You're just going to make an average return. When things are priced cheap, that's the time to invest. But that old adage of Warren Buffett of be greedy, you know, if everybody's fearful, be greedy. If everybody's greedy, be fearful. But as you said, it is so hard to do. And GPs, just like LPs, are guilty of investing at the top and putting a lot of money to work. And when they look back, those are some of their worst vintage years. So private equity is a real challenge because of the long lead time. And right now, EBITDA multiples are still priced to perfection. Nobody really marked their portfolio down during this prolonged stagflation or whatever it was in, in 02 and 03. Uh, or pardon me, 22 and 23. Uh, if you look at the equity market, it was a bull market. And that's why I think PE is held in there. But I'm not hearing uh, anybody uh, talk about selling any companies in here and they still have a lot of dry powder. So it's going to be challenging. I really have asked people what they think the vintage years of say 2021, uh, 22, 23 might return. Uh, I think that we're seeing the spread between private equity and public equity really narrow. When I started in the business, you could expect a full 5%, 500 basis points. Then we lowered it to 300. Now we're realistic and say, maybe it's just 150 net of fees over public equity. That's still worth the risk, but not a lot of risk to get 150 over public equity.
you know, you've delivered top quartile returns throughout your career. You received multiple awards, including CIO Lifetime Achievement Awards. Um, what are some of your secrets to investment success? What were some of the investment calls that you are most proud of getting right in your career? And then perhaps there were some mistakes that still haunt you. Well, I always say, people ask me, gee, with managing $300 billion, how do you sleep at night? And I say, I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours to scream. Um, you know, it. It uh, when I look first at the positives, uh, I will tell you it, uh, advice my father gave me, which is to hire the right people, uh, give them the right tools, point them in the right direction, and then get out of their way. Uh, I have been blessed to hire some amazing investment uh, people, uh, give them the right tools, and, and they have blown my socks off uh, by how well they have done. And the other thing I would say that, frankly, our secret sauce, and I think for most managers, their secret sauce when they produce alpha is their culture. And culture and investments, can you can have a star system. You can have a team system. It can be lots of different types of cultures. But every time I've studied a money manager that's done well, then done poorly, it's because the culture changed. And so to me, that culture is something you actually need to be intentional about and preserve. And I will say, people have told me from the outside, they notice at Calsters that we have a different culture than other people. And, and I take that to heart because it's been very intentional of me. I've had three different teams in my career because I've been at three different funds and they've all had different cultures. So I can say this one was here. It wasn't something I brought in. But it was a team culture I cemented in. So when I look back at some of our best calls, it's no question. It's being disciplined, sticking to our policy, forcing ourselves to rebalance when we weren't really sure we should. Um, you know, buying into uh, fixed income here recently when interest rates were zero. Uh, buying into equity markets, like I said, not in in March of '09, but by May of '09. Um, and really sticking to you know that that policy and that knitting, I think that really helps guide you, because again, as we said, you want to invest without emotion. Well, then you need some kind of guardrails because we are human beings; we're emotional. When I look at some of our worst investments, um, you know, I'll be honest, we've made a few of them. Uh, you know, we tried to redevelop a part of California that needed uh, desperately needed help. The city wanted it done. Uh, but boy, we realized that uh, the local residents didn't want it, uh, and that was painful. Never broke ground, never made anything, and lost money on it. Uh, I look back at some of our worst investments turned out to be some of our best investments, and and it really taught me that you know while you always want to be smart, sometimes it helps to be lucky. Uh, I love sharing the story of this one uh, company we invested in in 1999, very early. Uh, whole technology idea, you know, new, new advanced, everybody was excited about it. Big famous entrepreneur. Uh, and then in uh, after 0102, they came to me and said, well, you know, we did the seed round and now they're out of money and the company's technically bankrupt. Uh, so we have to put more money in to keep our place in, in the cap structure. And I'm like, all right, you know, a lot of companies needed that after 0102, let's do it. Then, to my surprise, they came to me in 08 and said, well, it's broke again. We need more money. And I, I remember sitting in this very office and saying, are we throwing good money after bad money? Come on, it's almost been a decade and this company hasn't produced anything, not a single product. And they said, well, we don't actually ever think they'll make the product. That just seems too far away, but we're going to make money on the patents. We're convinced of that. And I said, all right, we'll put more money in. And we wrote another check to stay in this company. And now when I tell people the name, they're like, well, yeah, that's obvious it was a home run. And I'm like, oh, no, no. We went through over a decade of having this go to zero twice and stay in it. Today, that, that company's name is Tesla, and they make cars. And I, I laugh at the staff because they were convinced they would never make a car. And, it, and if you go back and read the papers in 09, that was, that was the view. So- Rather fascinating, uh, very long rate of return or low rate of return because of very long investment. Uh, but true, what a home run. Now the most valuable car company in the world, go figure. So it just shows you that sometimes investments, uh, you know, really can test your metal and, and challenge you on what's going to work, what's not. 
Um, you know, we've had some fantastic investments that thankfully went to almost not, you know, zero to, to double in value overnight. Uh, another cute story, if you let me go, Olga. Uh, we, bu- we bought in in, uh, in around 2000. We did a co-investment in a theme park. Who doesn't love theme parks? What fun. And uh, well, 9-11 happened and tourism dropped to zero. And our investment dropped to near zero. And we sat there not making money for a good decade. Uh, and then this company decided to buy up a license of a, a book uh, uh, line that I had not heard of. We, my daughters and I, my daughters and my family weren't into it. We were more into Lord of the Rings and and all kinds of other things. But they bought into this uh, line of books and uh, made a land out of it. Uh, and uh, I had not followed it closely, but uh, something called Harry Potter. And uh, uh, suddenly it became one of the biggest tourist destinations in the world. And the uh, theme park, Universal Studios Orlando, called us and suddenly wanted our share back at exorbitant multiples. Uh, Again, the IRR was terrible because it was at zero for almost a decade. But uh, in the end, we made a ton of money uh, because of Harry Potter world. Go figure. Uh, And so just another example of where, you know, you you make an investment for one reason. And then thankfully down the road, something else comes in and bails you out. You get lucky. For For the Teslas and the Universal Studios, I probably have 15 other stories Unfortunately, we tend to, I tend to remember the, the tough times and not hang on to those good times. But um, you try to get perspective as you step back and, and you do have to have a short-term memory in some of those losses. Learn lessons from them. Make sure you don't make those mistakes. Uh, but really, you know, you're, when you're doing investments, you're trying to anticipate the future. And I don't have to tell the audience predicting the future is an inexact science. Love these stories. You know, most of the people when they think about these large LPs and managing so so much money, it you know, it it tends to be difficult imagining that these organizations can do something so high risk and innovative. So absolutely love these stories. And earlier you touched upon the question of culture. And everybody says it's extremely important, right? But it's also very difficult to truly understand what culture is. And sometimes People talk about, you know, our culture is like we want everybody to be hardworking and things like that. And the way I think about it is you have to define it with terms that have very clearly trade-offs, right? Because otherwise it doesn't doesn't matter. Everybody wants smart people, right? But the question is at what cost or what are some of the other things? So when you talk to managers, how do you evaluate, like, what is their culture? Do you have a view on sort of some of the things that you want to see, some of the elements you want to see, you know, like you mentioned Tesla, how do you feel about star, you know, founders and sort of that archetype? Um, let's let's talk about culture. Yeah, you know, it is an area that is so difficult to identify and measure. And I'm constantly challenging my staff because frankly, we're, we're mostly business majors, econ majors, as I like to tease them. You know, we went to the econ business side of the school. We generally avoided the psychology, human uh, arts side of the school as much as we could. Uh, and none of us, frankly, took nearly enough psychology classes. And very, there's nobody on my staff that I, I'm aware of that has a psychology major. My wife does. So I've learned from her. But understanding people. I tell the staff all the time, I have a better sense of how the market's going to go tomorrow. I have no sense of what's going to happen to the staff overnight and how they're going to be tomorrow and and how people are going to react to different things. It's so varied and so challenging. So first off, we're kind of coming at it from the standpoint that we're not trained to be culture experts and to read people. We're trained to do numbers and financial statements and, and investment analysis. The other thing I tell the staff is you're not going to pick up culture by meeting a manager in our office because they're going to bring you the top people and they're going to dress in nice clothes and present their best. You're also not going to learn about the culture by going to a manager and going to their conference floor. I know that's a coming uh, constant trend is to have a floor where all your conference rooms are, and that's great for companies. 
But for us, really, it's actually not very helpful because you just, you know, again, you're just meeting in a sterile conference room with nice views and and meeting the people that are prepared for the day. Some of our best manager meetings are when we walk the floor or when we look at the org chart and say, you know, thank you for the presentation, but I'd like to see so-and-so, a junior portfolio manager on our team and meet with them. Uh, and some of my favorite stories are when, you know, you, you watch the blood drain from the face of the marketing person because they haven't prepared so-and-so. And that person suddenly walks in wearing blue jeans and they're horrified because you can tell, oh, you weren't prepared to meet a client today. Cool. Um, and I'll just share this story. I'm full of stories. Uh, you know, my staff one time was meeting a manager to explain their investment process. It was a team process. Everybody got input on the portfolio decisions. We're like, okay. And they had good alpha. That, you know, although past track record is not predictive of the future, you got to find something. And uh, one of my younger staff, out of blue, said, uh, and again, we brought in somebody from the outside, uh, from uh, on staff, and it was he was wearing blue jeans that day. And we said, so it's a team vote. And he said, yeah. And one of my staff just, I don't know why, naively said, gee, uh, what do you do with split votes? And he goes, oh, uh, we never have split votes. They're always unanimous. Well, that piqued all our interest. We're like, wait, they're always unanimous? It's a team process? And he said, yeah, yeah. So we asked more. We said, well, gee, how do you vote? How does that work? And he goes, oh, the chief investment officer goes first and votes, and then we go around the table. We <laughs> excuse the person, and I said, okay. That's not, that's disrupting and disconcerting. But what you need to know is the chief investment officer, in this case, it was, I think, a portfolio manager, follow that portfolio manager. The alpha belongs to that person, not the team. And sure enough, when that person moved to another firm, the alpha went with them. And we had to defund that manager and we followed that person. So it's hard to figure out the culture. I've often asked managers, and I'm kind of known for sneaking around the floors, or I'll ask a manager if I can sit at their desk because, say, my plane flight or my next meeting's not for a couple hours, and I don't want to go hang out at Starbucks, and I'll just sit at the desk. Everybody will be on edge for 10, 15 minutes. Then they go back to their normal selves, and you can kind of get a feeling for, is there laughter? Is there talking? Uh, or is everybody frozen? Uh, and when the boss walks around, everybody drops their head. It gets busy. And, you know, it's hard to identify in words what that culture is, but you can kind of get a feeling. And what I tell the staff is you have to go back a lot, not just one visit, but a couple times in a year. And you have to go back again because to identify when that culture changes, you have to see it. You have to live it and believe it. The staff is going to call you and say, oh, our culture's changed. And that's what makes it really hard on, on managing and picking money managers, I think, is actually harder than picking stocks. Companies give you a lot of financials, a lot of data. You can pull it up on Bloomberg's, fact set, wherever. But you can't get that information on a general partner or on a money manager. Uh, and I'll go, you're right. Culture isn't a word. It's not something you put up on the board. Heck, even Enron had their ethics statements up on the board. Obviously, it doesn't mean a darn thing. For us, our, our culture is a word cloud. It is a whole series of words. It started as seven values, but now it's a whole series of words. And you also hit it on the head. Some are almost opposites. Uh, you know, we, we like to have fun, but we also like to have challenge. Uh, we like to have purpose. Uh, but we also like to have balance. Uh, so, you know, it, it really is trying to strike uh, the right tone with the staff. And the most important thing I can say to your audience is culture starts at the top and with management, not with the line employees. Management has to know its culture and push it and, and walk the talk. I actually flip it on its head. I tell my entry-level employees they can hold management accountable and me accountable for the culture. And we actually survey on it annually to find out where are we strong? Where are we weak? What have we done differently? Uh, I hold management and I impact their incentives based on how well they reinforce the culture. I had decided a long time ago that, that you know, we've seen people in our business that can produce results, but they come at a really high cost, either, you know, personnel problems or just, uh, you know, they're toxic in the work environment. Uh, I don't want that. 
you know, they can go somewhere else and make a ton of money. Here, I want you to make money, but you have to do it as part of a team in the right way. And and what I find is that culture gets the best out of people, uh, and it's helped in our retention and our diversity. Um, and you know, I will say I can brag for a minute. We we've won one of the listed, been listed almost the only government entities. Well, certainly for eight years in a row, the only government entity to be listed as one of the best places to work in money management. Uh, that's pretty rare because I can't offer the kind of incentives private industry can. Yep, um, absolutely. And going back to um, some of the investment themes, the last decade was very much defined by low interest rates, by a search for yield, um, a lot of the reallocation into private markets. What do you think are going to be potentially defining trends of the next decade? Well, first, let me talk about the past. My staff will groan because they know I love to talk about history. I started as a CIO, believe it or not, in 1986. So I've been through the 80s. I started in, you know, with Wall Street firms in 1981, uh, right before Ronald Reagan came in. So, you know, an inverted yield curve and uh, 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 high inflation, uh, Volcker as the Fed. So I've been through a lot. When I look at the 80s and the 90s now, we realize those were go-go years and amazing. But the the 2000s have really been a challenge. Uh, the OOs of 2000, um, obviously a recession at the start, then, a, then the great financial crisis at the end, uh, the decade of the 2010s. And what's remarkable about that when I look back at that history here at CalSTRS, interest rates have gone to zero twice. When I went to college, interest rates weren't supposed to go to zero, and they certainly could never go negative. That just is an impossibility, yet it's occurred. Now I have staff that have worked for 20 years, and they're used to zero interest rates. They're, an interest rate of five is so high, they can't believe it. Well, I remember when the long bond was eight, so and, and money markets were 13. So yeah, uh, very different perspective. And they're used to inflation being at zero. And I'm used to it when I started the business, inflation was running in the sevens and eights. So um, when I look forward, uh, it is an interesting challenge. I, I think, and, and when I look back, obviously, uh, demographics have been a mega trend. Urbanization, globalization have been huge uh, trends for the investment industry and themes to make money from. When I look forward, I think all three of those are absolutely going to be dwarfed by the energy transition. And let me say, you know, mankind's been using hydrocarbons to produce power since the British invented the steam engine using coal. And we generate all kinds of energy from hydrocarbons. That's got to dramatically change in the next 15 years. So think back before the steam engine and we were using horses and animals to pull and move things transportation, move goods. Uh, we were heating our houses by burning wood and, and raw materials. That was a massive change to suddenly get the steam engine and then get the automobile with hydrocarbons. We need so, something similar to that in the next 15 years. And that's going to be huge opportunity, but also huge risk. Demographics will still matter. Um, urbanization and globalization will still matter, but they will be dwarfed by this energy transition and impacted by the energy transition. Because if we don't change the energy transition, where we normally think of demographics in terms of just population and birth rates, what we're going to think about is migration. You're going to have in, in by 2035, you're going to have parts of the earth. If we don't, let me just say this, if we don't change our behavior, we human beings on the planet by 2035, you're going to have mass migrations away from certain parts of the world, causing huge humanitarian crises in other parts of the world. And I can't predict it, but I, uh, that sounds pretty bad for investment returns in an investment climate. Um, and so I'm worried about the challenges going forward. I think we have 15 years to be able to make a decent return if we finance and participate in that energy transition. If mankind doesn't participate in that energy transition, then you're going to be focused on risks across the board. So to me, and I tell people, if you're starting in this business and this is part of your career, this is a mega trend. I'm from California, so I think of mega waves. Out here, we call it mavericks, giant waves. To surf a giant wave, you have to get up to speed 
very quickly, but you have to time that wave. If you're too early, it's going to crush you. If you're too late, it's going to miss you completely. This is a massive transition wave coming. And I don't think enough people are getting up to speed. And I don't think people are preparing for it. Uh, and I don't think they're prepared to ride it. At Calsters, we're absolutely paddling as fast as we can because we're big fun. So in surfing terminology, we're a long board. And that means we got to keep, we're got to be moving. But right now I can say it's a real challenge to time it because when I look out the window, mankind isn't changing our behavior fast enough. And uh, I'm worried about that, but we're also poised to invest in it. And I think money managers have to start paying attention to this and thinking about it. Uh, and I think we're already seeing companies, uh, progressive companies are absolutely at the front end and thinking about it. Even old traditional companies are thinking about it. Um, and somewhere around 2028, you're really going to have to divide the world between companies that have are, are stuck in the 1950s and the old way of producing energy. When, when I say energy, I mean electricity, mobility, um, uh, heavy manufacturing. Uh, even agriculture versus companies that are thinking forward and and changing their mix and finding ways to do things differently. And so what what does that mean uh, for for the Calsters portfolio as as you look at your investments, where are you investing today, or maybe how do you change your approach to investing in some of the asset classes? Um, talk to us a little bit about that and then also potentially where you see the gaps um, in investment offerings in the market um, to support this um, energy transition related investing. You bet, Olga. The way we're already in, we've already started on that, that surfboard and started paddling. We've changed our equity portfolio so that 20% of it is invested in low emissions companies. Uh, we've changed our fixed income portfolio, so 15% reduction in carbon emissions. And that's just the beginning. We will increase that over time as we see the world change. Uh, we've, we've added uh, energy transition into our investment analysis in every transaction. So we want to know from GPs, whether it's private equity, infrastructure, anything, what are you doing about this? What are you thinking about it? Pledging is great, but words are cheap. What actions are you taking now here in 2024? What steps are you already beginning to take to, to move into that transition? And then we're talking certainly in term, from a risk standpoint of looking at parts of the portfolio where we're worried they're not making that transition. Uh, and we're looking at it as an opportunity and a risk. We're investing in climate solutions where we might be able to buy a dirty asset and help clean it up because it will improve the price of that asset. Mm -hmm. Then in other areas, we are avoiding things like coal and saying, you know what, that technology is past tense and we are not going to invest in it. We don't think it has a long-term future and it shouldn't. Um, we're trying to mitigate areas, things like methane, and work with industries and companies to reduce that risk and that waste. But at the same time, we're also investing in those kind of opportunities of where can we push change, where can we seek new opportunities. We know when we look out into the future, we need more energy across the board. The globe will need more energy of all types, and that energy uh, distribution of where we get our energy fund has to shift away from hydrocarbons. Even by 2050, it's not going to eliminate hydrocarbons. It just has to diversify to a lot of other energy sources. We can't produce enough wind and solar. That's a major place we need, but you can't rely on that exclusively. You need everything, an entire mix of a diversified energy portfolio, whether it's electricity, mobility, agriculture, heavy industry, you need all kinds of different power. So we think that's a really interesting investment theme. Uh, it's something we're looking at our portfolio, but we're also looking at it as where do we need to mitigate our risks? Um, and at Calsters, it's just the beginning. I, like I said, I think in the USA, we're absolutely at the front edge of implementing this in the staff, educating the staff, because this again is biology and climatology stuff that we didn't take classes on and have to learn about. Um, I've spent last summer learning about blue hydrogen and green hydrogen and all the colors um, and about methane, different things, chemistry, basic hydrocarbon chemistry to understand where are the risks and things. 
So we have to retrain the staff, but we also have to change our risk analytics to be thinking bigger and broader than just accounting ratios and balance sheets to forward-looking statements and what are people thinking and how are they implementing. And that's that's a real challenge, again, because it's the future. But I, I can't emphasize enough to, to money managers of you have to wrap your head around this. There's a lot of people, my generation and the baby boom that don't, you know, they're at the end of their career. They don't want to have to learn something new. They don't want to change what they've done. I can tell you in, in nature, we know if you don't adapt, you die. And this is the time where people have to adapt and learn new things and, and open their eyes. The change has to happen. And, and frankly, in the next 15 years, which is, you know, maybe not in my working career, but in everybody else's working career, they have to see a massive change uh, in how we live and, and how we manage portfolios. So at CalSTRS, it's an it, integrating part of us. Uh, we pledge to net zero. We want to have a 50% reduction in the portfolio by 2030. I can shift the portfolio to reduce our emissions. But I like to say it's not a movie, you know, the the old uh, field of dreams, build it and they will come. We can change, but no one's going to follow us. What we need is the world to change so that we can invest in it. We need General Motors and Ford, Exxon and Chevron, um, Royal Dutch Shell. We need the companies around the world to change what they do so that we can make money in that new future. Um, and again, make money uh, across the generation. So it's going to be a real challenge. Yeah. And as you are thinking um, about this shift, are there some people in the industry who you think are very thoughtful about their approach to this topic and um, who might be your thought partners? And that can be anyone on the LP, GP side, or it could be sort of, you know, scientists or industry experts. Um, who are some of the people that you feel have have done a lot of work in that area and what they're doing is really interesting and worthwhile? Well. Thank you. One name jumps out off the board and everybody knows it is Mark Carney, uh, the UN ambassador and somebody who's definitely leading the edge and, and a thought leader in a lot of places, currently working for a money manager. I don't want to endorse them. but um, uh, And there are a lot of organizations, frankly, too many organizations, because you spend a lot of time in meetings talking. That doesn't help. You need to spend time doing and planning and changing. Um, but lots of organizations, lots of leading edges uh, were involved uh, with uh, Cambridge University has done some amazing work with universal owners on existential risks in addition to climate change. Uh, part of Climate Action 100 and engaging companies, uh, you know, we teamed up with Engine One to take on Eng uh, Exxon Mobil to get them to finally change the way they think, to go from a, uh, a denier and a resistor to somebody who's starting to slowly change their brain and think differently. And, and they now say they're a molecule company instead of an oil and gas company. While that's small, that's actually huge. Um, and you know, when you think globally, the the certainly the Europeans are much more cutting edge. Uh, we have a lot in common with PGGM and APG. Uh, we do a lot of work with Government of Singapore, um, with uh, CPPAV, Canadian Public Pension Plan, uh, Ontario Teachers, British Columbia, um, New Zealand, Australia Super, uh, HESTA. So I can run down. It, in a way, it's sad. I can count on my hands the 10 funds we team up with. It's sad to me because I wish there were 20 or 30 or 40 or 100 funds that we could team up with. But uh, there's a narrow group of really amazing global funds that are thinking ahead. Uh, we bump into each other all the time and and talk and interact on global conference calls and share best practices of what different people are doing, where are they on that transition, how far do they want to get ahead uh, of where the world is. Uh, and And what's valuable is we're teaming up and collaborating on investment opportunities. Uh, instead of competing with each other and trying to steal the best ideas, um, you know, many of these require an immense amount of capital. So we're sharing them. Uh, but uh, David Blood, uh, I'll say the name of Generations, certainly an absolute thought leader. Um, you know, uh, uh, Impact Invest, uh, another thought leader. Uh, a lot of bright people, and those are the people I interact with and talk with. And and when I move on from Calsters. I'm going to absolutely dedicate my Encore career to this, what I see as a massive energy transition and trying to help people 
change their staff, change their investment process so they incorporate it and think about it, uh, and then reporting. And you asked where are the weak links? You know, the weak links are on the reporting side. We get inconsistent information from companies, uh, uneven reporting. You know, some are reporting in metrics, some are reporting in standards, some are reporting in one measure, some on another, some on one cycle, some on another cycle. To make an investment decision, you need clean, preferably uh, audited, but clean information that's consistent. So you can compare ExxonMobil to uh, Royal Dutch Shell to Total to British Petroleum to Chevron and then make a decision. Um, and so <clears throat> we've been pushing large companies, but now we need the mid cap and the small cap companies to report. And we need one global standard. Unfortunately, you know, think about the, the perfect example for anybody that travels. Think about the number of adapters you have to take to plug into the wall. But when you plug in your iPhone or your Android, you have one USB cord. Well, now you have two USB C, but still only two cords for the whole world and a gazillion adapters. We need a standard set of metrics that the world reports on and that we can then analyze for these kinds of investment decisions. So I have been spending time at the ground roots effort of trying to get standardization, get investors together so that we're unified in asking for the same thing. So we don't give companies uh, survey fatigue. We ask for the same information. They can report it out. Hopefully someday it will be audited. I'd love for it to be mandated by regulators. That way they have to. California is taking that stand, but you know we're just one little state out of 50 and one little part of the world. We're a leader in certainly climate, uh, but we need a global standard. We don't need a European standard, a US standard, an Asian standard. Yeah. Um, and I know we have just a few minutes left. And um, given a lot of our audience are um, founders of companies in the technology sector and VCs, I have to ask about your views on technology, on venture capital. Obviously, given the size of your program, um, you know, this this might not be the asset class where you're spending most of the time. So um, let's let's talk about how you think about you know some of the esoteric asset classes or smaller capacity constrained asset classes, how you think about investing in those given your size and sort of what can move the needle, but then just more specifically venture capital technology, what are some okay. of the themes that are interesting to you, where you're investing, where Calsters is looking to be more active. And I'll do my best to give you a concise answer. Uh, when it comes to economies of scale, it really helps to be huge but it also makes it difficult. Think of us as a giant cruise ship out in the ocean. We're always out in the ocean. We never come to the harbor. So we can't spin on a dime. We can only subtly adjust the ship. You know, we can sail when it's good weather. We have the parties and open the deck and get the buffet. When it's bad weather, we buckle down, but we're still out in the ocean. Small endowments and family offices, those are like speed boats around us. They can spin on a dime. And so there are areas that we can't invest in that just won't move the needle. I created an innovation group simply for that to test drive things. You know, I love Wall Street loves to advertise new ideas every year. And I want to find out, does it work at our scale and does it work with our rules as a governmental entity? And there are a lot of things that we passed on that might be a good investment for somebody else, but, you know, just couldn't put enough money to work at, our, at the right scale. And venture capital is one of those challenging areas. I am really sad to say, you know, in their wisdom, the legislature created some laws that created increased transparency, which is good for newspapers, but makes it really hard for us as investors to invest in venture capital because the venture capitalists like secrets. So when you think about PERS and STIRS, uh, we actually have lower allocations to venture capital in California, our own state, compared to other funds like Washington. So. It's a hard place for us to invest. We're very transparent, which makes it a challenge. But I absolutely believe venture capital has a place in every portfolio. It is a, a huge risk and return. Obviously, you can have, I've had 100% returns. I've had zero returns. So it's an area where you shouldn't really put all your money to work unless it's the high risk, the only, you know, the, the top layer of risk in your portfolio. But I think when I look at this future, I can get, pretty depressed pretty quick, unfortunately. But I think and have hope in the fact that human beings are inventive and innovation. And that, you know, when I look at the technology that's been discovered in my life, 
I, I really believe there's hope that we will discover new energy and different energy sources going forward. Um, we can invest in the infrastructure build out of those. I mm-hmm. hope we're invested in the venture creation of those, but you know, there are going to be 10 to 20 things and only one's going to be a unicorn. And that's not a very good batting average when you're big. When you're small, maybe you have the Midas touch and you can pick that one out of 20 opportunity. Uh, We invest a little bit in all of them, but we want to be there when that's ready to then go mainstream because think about gas stations, think about anything. If you're going to distribute energy on a global scale, that's a lot of infrastructure. Somebody will make money in the technology side, but we're ready there to make money on the on the on the ventures or on the uh, infrastructure side or the build out side. But you know, venture technology is amazing. I've seen amazing things in the life sciences. Tough place to make money in, but amazing things in the future uh, for life sciences. Uh, and then obviously, just amazing in. AI is just a whole new world. People are speculating on one hand, it's the end of mankind. On the other hand, it's the savior to mankind. (laughs) What an extreme point of view. You know, it's not just going to be the future. Um, It's not just going to be hit or miss. It's going to be something in between those two, but we'll have to see. It it really is going to be interesting. The rapid change, Moore's law is in effect that that things happen twice as fast as we all expect. And uh, this this issue of AI is really an amazing uh, change to have machines thinking like humans. I try to put it to everybody this way. You know, the internet took the yellow pages. Google took the yellow pages. I remember yellow pages. Took the yellow pages and actually gave them to you on your fingertip globally. AI is going to take all the knowledge and written material in the world in every language and put it at your fingertips within seconds. Um, So if somebody has thought of something and discovered something, you have access to it now instead of having to read about it or hope it gets translated um, that's a huge change to mankind um, and and hopefully a, a huge opportunity if we can control a property. Yep. Well, we are in the business of being optimists and underwriting a lot of that positive change. Um, and so I'm cautiously optimistic that people will figure out how to make this technology be net positive in in some very impactful ways. But um, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a great conversation and a pleasure to get to know you more. Thank you. Hey, it's been a blast. Thank you, Olga. Thank you to your audience for listening. Thanks so much for listening to the Village Global podcast. You can check us out online at villageglobal.vc. We'd love to hear from you, your feedback, your ideas, your inspirations. You can email us at hello at villageglobal.vc.